Okay, good morning. I'm going to ask Richard if he'll open us with a word of prayer. Dear Lord and Savior, we're thankful for the many blessings of this life. Give us wisdom, justice, and understanding so that we can cope with the issues at hand. Dear Lord, forgive us for our sins. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Okay. We have... Uh, Believe it or not, the little yellow sheet's getting something on it. Not much of it's worth anything, but uh, we're getting stuff on it. Y'all are committee chairman. How hey, you let some of this stuff out? Good grief. I don't think I've ever heard that before. What was that? I don't know what it is. You let some of it out. The committee chairs let stuff out. No, I'm saying, how do you let it out? Not, not, why? Okay. Ms. Braddock. Good morning, y'all. I have um, House Bill 794, which is a compact among the states that requires the, um, a constitutional amendment where the federal government has to balance the budget and it limits their ability to raise the debt ceiling. And um, I'll take questions. That's essentially what it does. Anyone have questions for Ms. Bradley? It, it was 794. Thank you. Mr. Dickey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of committee. Uh, this morning I have uh, HB 773. Uh, as you may or may not, not know, current state law prohibits the discharge of a firearm within 50, road, 50 yards of a public road or highway for any reason whatsoever. And this bill uh, addresses the potential problems that have arisen under this 50 yards restriction zone. Uh, this bill allows four exceptions. Uh, number one is uh, exception if it's an indoor outdoor sports shooting range. Uh, such as skeet shooting or target practice. It also would exempt facilities used for firearm hunting and safety courses, and also a business that's a licensed dealer that repairs, sells, or demonstrates firearms. A lot of them have indoor ranges in their businesses, and also it, it would exempt legal, and I say legal hunting, uh, not not being within a municipality. So uh, this bill doesn't supersede or, or change any other. Um, uh, laws or statutes that relate to uh, to legal uh, shooting or hunting. So, thank you for your consideration. Any questions? Thank you. Oh, wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. <laughs> Ms. Eagle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to Mr. Dickey. Um, I'm assuming there's a reason why we don't want people discharging firearms within 50 yards of a public roadway. And with these exemptions that we're putting in, um, how are we going to uh, ensure that the public safety is still intact? Um, thank you. Um, we, we've got lots of laws now about um, shooting down a road, across a road. Those are still going to be against the law. Um, DNR is, is very happy with this rule. You know, a lot of times if you're 50 yards within uh, a, a place where you're hunting, you don't know where the road is. And, and so this kind of uh, DNR is very comfortable. They came and testified uh, in, in favor of this bill. Um, and you still have municipality uh, covenants and road, I mean, uh, um, uh, municipal ordinances against shooting. Uh, and, and so those are still would be intact. I'm not trying to override anything like that but a lot of hunters in rural areas within this 50 yard thing so I, I, I I'm not trying to do anything like that uh, 
Mr. Rice. Yeah, thank you for the bill, uh, Representative Dickey. Uh, what's magic about 50 yards? Excuse me. What's magic about 50 yards? Uh, I don't know. I don't know when that was put into um, Georgia code, um, but it's uh, you know it's 150 feet, and you, you, nobody can you know determine where, where where that is. So it's sort of uh, DNR likes you kind of backing up, knowing where that road is, so you're not shooting uh, over it. So so we're just pulling it in. We're just changing changing that 50 yard. Mr. Powell. We did, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, we did come back to your committee uh, with some changes to it, and um, DNR and GMA both testified in favor of this bill. Correct, it is, plenty of those, and this does not uh, affect those at all. Yeah, maybe so. And uh, we, I've got a um, uh, indoor shooting range in a, in a commercial area in, in, in near my district. I think it's in Mr. Peake's district that um, would be in violation uh, every every shot that's taken in, inside that indoor uh, shooting range. Uh, so, Ms. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What was the purpose of this bill? Were we having problems with public safety that people were getting too close to the road shooting, or were trying to make we're, it for the indoor places like this and all? I don't understand. Um, we're trying to avoid future problems. Uh, maybe some authority might want to shut down the shooting range uh, at some time in the future. Uh, I don't know, being in violation of state law. Um, it's just not very practical to relocate some of these things outside it in, in, a, in an urban area a lot of um, gun dealers have little small indoor things where they uh, would uh, sight in a gun or repair a gun and make sure it's operating so it's, it's kind of heading off potential problems down the road no no issues now okay thank you thank you thank you thank you appreciate you mr. Lumsden Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I bring to you today House Bill 766, which is a, work, a rewrite of the uh, work-based learning uh, bill that was passed uh, back in 1994-1995. The um, issue was brought to me by a uh, local work-based learning coordinator who uh, identified a problem that they were having with getting 16 and 17 year olds who were wanting to participate in this program, uh, getting them to uh, be able to get into the work environment. It seems that some of the uh, business partners that um, they tried to uh, work with had some uh, issues with the 16 and 17 year olds, not so much the 18 year olds, but the 16 and 17 year olds. So if we're not able to get those students into the uh, work environment, that certainly uh, diminishes the effectiveness of the program. So as we began to look into what the issues were around that, why were we not able to get the 16 and 17 year olds uh, into the work environment? Um, first thing that came to my mind, of course, was uh, insurance, which indeed is part of the equation. But it, uh, as we looked into the issue, it was obvious that it was not all of the, the uh, uh, it was not the sole problem. Uh, I went to um, Dwayne Hobbs, who is the head of the um, program with the Department of Education, and uh, worked with him uh, through this process. And we brought in uh, representatives from the uh, Department of Insurance, from the Department of Labor, uh, as well as the uh, Lieutenant Governor's Office. Uh, so this is a, a bill that has been looked at uh, from di many different angles. And uh, this is really just the first step of what will likely be a three-step process in dealing with this issue with work-based learning. But one of the things that we uh, identified as we looked at this uh, whole issue was that uh, the current work-based learning law 
uh, was really outdated because work-based learning is something that is going on nationwide, not just here in Georgia. Although Georgia has been on the uh, cutting edge of this for many years, uh, and we still are, we, 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 we still uh, are at uh, the top in terms of our work-based learning. There are some areas that we needed to change regarding the language that was in the original bill. So what you have before you, House Bill 766, is the uh, first step in uh, changing some of the language and some of the definitions in the work-based learning law to bring them current with what is uh, really going on in the area of work-based learning today. Did you go to the Paul Battle School of Continuing? <laughs> I, 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 I beg your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. This is the first time I've you, done you've this. Had, you've had my indulgence. <laughs> Ms. Abrams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Lumsden, I'm looking at line 52, which strikes the progressive wage schedule. Uh, can you speak to why we will no longer require these work-based learning programs to provide some level of financial support to the students because although these programs are designed to help these students learn these skills, they also are often required to do fairly intensive work. And part of the reason for the existence of the progressive wage schedule was to make certain that we weren't creating a subclass of employees, basically 16, 17, and 18 year olds who were working for free and maybe getting some minimal work credit but were also being asked to do uh, work that should be compensated at some level. So can you speak to why we're in the requirement that there be some wage schedule associated with these programs? As I said, this was a collaborative effort. This uh, issue was raised. As I recall the uh, discussion, it was uh, keeping uh, some of those um, uh, businesses and, and uh, that, that might be willing to partner with the school systems. Uh, that along with the, the insurance uh, was one of the things that uh, was felt by all of those who actually conduct the program that it would uh, be more beneficial for uh, encouraging those businesses to partner with us because we're selling a product uh, to to the um, potential uh, business partners. They have to have uh, a, a uh, it has to be a win-win for them. So this was some of the um, uh, discussion, as I recall, relative to the issue that you raised. Mr. Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's always a learning experience. The longer you talk, the more time we have to actually read it and come up with questions. So um, I, this is addressed to your, your number two and three steps, because I know it's, this is for public schools. And is, is step two and three going to include anything for private and more specifically for homeschooling? The um, steps two and three as envisioned uh, are still um, subject to change, but as we look at the things that are impediments for businesses to want to engage in this program, as I mentioned, insurance is one of them. One of the things that we will be looking at is uh, potentially a carve out as a uh, method of uh, dealing with that. Um, uh, we have issues with liability as well as workers' comp. So uh, the uh, broad nature of the workers' comp laws um, make that uh, an impediment for uh, some of the uh, businesses to uh, want to engage with 16 and 17 year olds. As I said, we're not having the problem with 18 year olds because the law already covers those, but the 16 and 17 year olds. The other has to do with the uh, OSHA data that um, has been um, uh, kept with, uh, concerning 16 and 17 year olds. This is a separate class uh, of, um, uh, of worker in that it's in a, uh, a structured, um, monitored, controlled program as opposed to the average 16 or 17 year old. Okay, so, so basically my question about whether it affects private schools or, or <laughs> this, we, we don't this, know. this does not right. affect private schools. Right. No, sir. Thank you. Heck fire, I think maybe you gave the class on that. <laughs> you don't want to for, know. For those ask. people that get on the wall, this is supposed to be kind of quick. Okay. I, short, I, I'm to the point. Okay. Don't put the chairman's slap to sleep, you know. Okay. It, uh, Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On uh, line 68 through 71. You mentioned a, an eligibility for funding or assistance available from the, through the code section. 
Do you mind telling me, does this have any budget impact? N this has no budget impact. So what's, what's this funding assistance eligibility pertain to then? Uh, only those things that are already in place. There, I'm, I'm, there, there's, this has uh, no, no call for additional funding. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lumsden. No more questions. Thank you. You did wave, didn't you, Tom? Yes, sir. Th thank you. Get the two of y'all both talking. I might not ever get out of here. <laughs> Ms. Davenport, is this your first time here? No. It's, okay. It's not my first time being here. Thank I, you. This is, is, y'all, this is a senator. Senator. Y'all be nice to her. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and to the members of the committee. I have before you today a bill, Stacy Nicole English Act, and it's basically to aid in the location of a missing person who may have a severe medical condition. Uh, one thing that it does is to prohibit minimum waiting periods for initiating a missing person. Uh, if a person is, uh, has a medical condition that's incapacitated, uh, this bill will help them. Uh, I know we have the Maddox call, but this bill will help the young lady. Uh, Nacy Cole English lived in North Atlanta. Her car was found near the Lakewood um, uh, amphitheater, you know, several years ago during the Christmas season. Uh, the car was running, the keys in the car, and the police did exactly what they were supposed to do, and they went to her home, but she was not there because she had a medical condition. She was found uh, a few uh, feet away from the car uh, several days later. Uh, and one of the things that this bill, I, I know we have the Maddox call, but one thing this bill will do is that will provide emergency contact information in a vehicle registration uh, application form. Uh, so I ask your uh, favorable consideration on this bill. Any questions from Ms. Davenport? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I bring for consideration this morning House Bill 654, which is brought to us by the State Bar of Georgia in the Family Law Section, working with the probate judges and the Fiduciary Law Section to make some procedural changes to the appointment of testamentary guardians in wills and estate plans. Uh, the need for this bill arose and became evident uh, in a case, tragic case, that came out of Clark County in a murder-suicide at the Athens Theater and the conflict and the procedural gaps in the law about how the children of the murder-suicide parents would be procedurally managed in the probate court and, and will probates. Any questions? Thank you. Okay. Mr. Hamilton. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask again for uh, House Bill 837. M Mr. Weldon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, ask for House Bill 654. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. If you can quit. Okay. All right. Go. House Bill 654, please, sir. Ms. Abrams. I'd like to put my name behind, beside Bill 654 and Senate Bill 23. And what was the last one? Senate Bill 23. Ms. Hughley. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to also add my name to the chorus for Senate Bill 23. Okay. All right. All right, what we're gonna do, is we're gonna set the calendar for Friday. And just as a reminder, if you've got a bill and it has gotten out of committee, the chairman of that committee reports to the clerk's office that, that it's there, and then you have to come by my office and fill out a little form so that we can get the forms, because if you haven't filled out the form, there ain't no sense you getting on the wall. It's real simple.
ain't been by. You don't come by, you don't get nothing. You might not get nothing anyway, but that's okay. You got at least at least you got a chance. And then there's some on the back. Those those Senate bills, like they're on the back. All right, gonna set it for Friday under modified open HB 837. Do I hear a move? All right, any opposition? It's on under modified open HB 654. Any opposition? Under modified open HB 773. Any opposition? Is Lumsden still in here? I was just seeing if I could get him to make a promise. He'd do, do a little bit shorter rendition when we get on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I learned from Earl. I don't know about y'all, but I learned from Earl. <laughs> he, he's probably got a gun. He's a state patrolman. I'm a little worried. All right. Mod modified open HB 766. Do I hear a move? Any opposition? That's it.